Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the House of Bloodstein, Mentralysis, Part 2, Chapter 9, 1000 Carahill Park. And if you recall from last week, the Jones totally handled Lord Cable and his stalwart companion, the Hightath warrior Leica, in the Mystery Library. Although Kay and Leica did a lot of damage, killed a lot of Jones, they had a lot more Jones in reserve. They rebounded like troopers. They blinded Kay's gifts. They lobbed in some grenades that was full of some stinky, sweet-smelling stuff. And Kay lost his dark sight. And without his dark sight, allowing him to navigate the ins and outs of the near future like a boss, it was just a matter of time before they got stomped on by the Jones. And they did. Leica fell wounded innumerable times. Kay, although he wasn't shot, was about to get killed by the Jones. And then he recited... K, uh, the summoning litany that they used to bring Kang into existence. It just passed through his head as he was falling unconscious. He murmured the words and then there was an explosion and then everything went dark. And that's where we ended last week. This week, 1000 Kara Hill Park. And in all the books I've written, I've got about 12 or 13 out at the moment. I, I can't remember. There are certain chapters that I really loved and I just had a good time writing. And this is one of them. I mention Carahill fairly frequently. He is a, a member of the Celestial Arboreum. And in my League of Elder Worlds, that means he's basically a god. And that's not necessarily awesome he's far from omnipotent the gods are not omnipotent in my universe they merely have a higher point of view a greater vision they can see the big picture what's going on and they're able to affect things alter fate change outcomes you know do parlor tricks and the lot they can't really do much more because it will throw off universal balance and if they do that then they'll turn into a demon and be sent to the windage of kind which is the the hell of the gods carahill almost got sent to the windage in book two the hazards of the old ones but he pulled through and everything worked out and he was fine and i I, I mention the nodes of Carahill. There's a lot of like little places that are associated with Carahill. The Mystery Library is one of them. It is a arcane temple, basically, to Carahill. And Ser Lady Sarah is the high priestess of this temple. She doesn't even know it's a, a, a temple to of Carahill, but it is. And in the past, he's used this little temple to hide things from the sisters, especially. After the Temple of the Exploding Head debacle, the sisters were on a bit of a rampage and they were going to all the great houses and looking for signs of the Kestrel oligarchy. And they were just using all their gifts, which are considerable because they have use of Hyper TK, which is one of the schools of magic and they were looking for stuff, looking for signs of the Kestrel. And they looked all through Castle Blanchford as well. Even though the Blanchfords have been traditional friends of the sisters, they, they checked them out anyways. Didn't find shit. Moved on. But all the the good stuff Kara Hill had hidden inside the mystery library. And it, it foiled their TK and their various other methods to find arcane stuff so it does work and in the back of the library is this arcane node which goes to other places associated with Carahill. we'll find the there's a little pocket node that's like a beach and a little cliffside and that's really all it is is just a just a beach and a cliffside it's not very it's a very small node and then down the lane 
At the other direction is the horrific cathedral of bone and wire that is inhabited by a snarling, slathering beast. And if you've read or listened to Cat, my cat readings, which you should, because Cat is a great book, if I do say so myself, you find out what is what is haunting the Cathedral of Bone and Wire. Most places associated with Carahill are, are happy places, fun places. The Cathedral of Bone and Wire is not. It's scary and dank and dark and rusty. It's something right out of a nightmare, but it is one of Carahill's places. There is a little bit of darkness in everybody, and Carahill is no exception. And then the place we're going to explore today, 1000 Carahill Park. That is another arcane node of Carahill, and it is more in keeping with Carahill's spirit, his love of fun and sweets and pranks and good cheer. To those who please him, to those who gain his favor, they're allowed to browse around inside this store, 1000 Carahill Park, which is 1000 Carahill Park is actually a, a park on Xandar that was dedicated to Carahill after he helped save the planet in book two. It's a park by the River Tor, and there's 1,000 statues of Carahill there, various sizes. And if you take the twists and turns of the path correctly and you are favored, you end up in this mystical store that Carahill presides over. And we will see what's going on inside this place and I hope you enjoy it the way I, I enjoyed co in conceiving of it and executing it here in the story. I'd been wanting to add 1000 Carahill Park but didn't have the right timing, didn't really fit in the stories and then you know things fall into place and here in this book was the perfect place to put it after getting his nuts handed to him by the Jones. So Let's proceed, shall we? Part 2, Chapter 9, 1000 Carahill Park. Lord Blanchford. Kay tried to open his eyes, but they were still swollen shut. He felt like a battered, disfigured mess. He sighted through. He was lying prone in a sea of pleasant smells. He was in some sort of brightly lit marketplace with shelves and orderly aisles trailing off a surprising distance in all directions. He heard soft music playing somewhere in the background. He wondered for a moment if he was dead and if this was the Vith Gallery of the Dead, where all his ancestors waited. If so, it was certainly much cheerier and sweeter smelling than he would have guessed, serenaded by pleasing music to pass eternity with. Perched overhead on a lacy iron beam was a silver bird with shiny feathers. Looked like king. Actually, there were several kings perched across the beam in an orderly procession. He must be dreaming, yet after a moment, he determined Determined most of the kings looking impassively down at him were some sort of stuffed toy designed in King's image, with the real one sitting quietly in their midst. King? Kay asked. Is that you? You're, you're back! Where have you been? From behind, King spoke. My mission was at an end. I was headed to my disincorporation in the servant's graveyard, as I am tasked to do by my creator. I witnessed the Jones land and commenced their attack, per my creator's wishes. Once I commence my journey to the graveyard to disincorporate, I am considered deactivated. As such, I can no longer take action until the summoning litany is re-uttered. I also could not return to your side until the litany was re-uttered. I waited in the library node. You summoned me, and I was returned at last. There is no need for me to re-imprint. That aspect remained. We'll have to talk to Lady Poe about this disincorporation thing. It's good to see you, King. I am pleased I did not complete my journey to the graveyard. Kay took in his situation. He was in a large, well-stocked marketplace of cheery pastel colors. Directly overhead was a rotunda made of wrought iron and glass, emitting an abundance of daylight. 
A purple sky shone through the glass, which looked to Kay like Xandar's distinctive sky. Kay was sitting atop a rounded, decorative island made of shale and sand, rising up in a gentle, miniature mountain. A ring of clean water surrounded the island, enclosed by a lacy iron fence. A harem of live seals milled about at the base of the shale mountain. Their whiskered faces all looked up at Kay, distressed that their home had been invaded. Where are we, King? A node, deep within the library. A what? Nearby, Leka was prostrate on his side and not moving. Kay feared the worst. He stood and went to her. King flew up and perched on the iron fence silently watching. Leka was badly wounded in the chest, shoulders, arms, and neck. She was lying in a pool of her own thick, high-tath blood, painting the shale red. He was certain she was dead. A wave of dread and grief passed through him. King, what happened to the Jones? He asked as he attempted to tend to Leka. She was such a wreck. He didn't know where to begin. I destroyed many of them, and they retreated in confusion. I did not pursue. I tended to you instead. I was able to drag you to safety here. I assumed, given your past actions and tendency toward sentimentality, that you wish the high task saved as well. You assume correctly. Leka was alive, but barely. Her heart still beat, and what was left of her blood still flowed. From below, at the base of the island, the seals barked up at them in dismay. She was a quivering, bullet-riddled, rocket-scarred disaster. Her girl-like face was mutilated and barely recognizable. The Jones shot Leka in the face with a rocket. It wouldn't be long. It was a bit much for Kay. His beloved wife, Sam, was in a stasis capsule on Hoban. And now here was Leka, whom he liked very much, about to die. Leka groaned, and Kay knelt over her. He propped her bloody head up. A Jones rocket blast had removed a healthy portion of her cheek, exposing broken teeth and the hollow of her mouth. Leka? Leka? He said. The Hightath cannot hear you. She is soon to die from her wounds. Shall I put her out of her misery? I can make it quick. Her name is Leka. I'd appreciate you using it. Kay came down and away from the island, scattering the seals. He hopped the fence and searched for something, anything to help Leka. He found a number of linen shirts folded nearby, neatly on a shelf. A stamped patch on the right breast read, 1000 Kara Hill Park, Xandar. He quickly returned and dabbed her bloody face with the shirts. King, are we on Xandar? Possibly. How can that be? This is a node hidden within the library. Clearly arcane in nature. Leka's body was half destroyed. She had taken multiple rocket hits to her side, her back, and her face. One of her arms was nearly severed. Many of her fingers were broken, and some were missing entirely. Kay tried to sight, but it was slow and unresponsive, a lingering effect of the Jones grenade. He concentrated and pushed their effects from his head, and the sight opened before him. What he saw was truly horrifying. Leka had more bullets lodged in her body than he could easily count. She was ruined and shrapnel riddled. She was partially disemboweled. How she remained alive in such a state was beyond him. Leka painfully stirred. Drogon, she lisped. Kay moved in close. I'm here, Leka. She wheezed. <sighs> Not comfortable. <sighs> Don't speak. Don't speak. Save your strength. Let me help make you comfortable. He unclipped her belt and struggled to move it aside. King fluttered up and took it, able to carry vast weights well beyond his tiny kingfisher size. Kay unlaced her boots and, with great effort, pulled them off and set them aside. He unclipped and unbuckled her breastplate. Blood lay everywhere underneath. King lifted it away. One of her uninjured hands came up and took his, squeezing ever so slightly. You are very brave, Leka. You fought well, took many lives. She closed her eyes. Stay with Leka. I'm not going anywhere. King impassively observed. She suffers, Lord Blanchford. And there is no hope of healing her. I can give her instant peace. She fell into a fitful sort of sleep. 
Kay stood and looked at the abundance of things all around. A market this large should have a proprietor or two. Perhaps they could summon help. Hello? He called out into the hollow air. Can someone help us? He received no reply. Watch Laka, please, he said to King and wafted down to the floor, past the iron fence. He saw a sales counter in the distance and hurried there. He didn't have time to appreciate any of the wonders placed on the shelving as he passed. He saw a case full of confectionery, all in inviting colors. He smelled the aroma of pie and frosted cakes, hard candies, chocolates, assorted fruit and baked goods, and a long, chilled case of ice cream in endless pastel colors. It smelled so good. It cleared the remnants of the Jones grenade from his nose. As he neared the counter, he passed a number of statues, some in the shape of giant-sized cats of various species, and some in the shape of seal-like aquatic mammals, a walrus, a furry seal pup, and a sea lion. Standing tall over the statues was a slender human female sculpture in an alluring gown carved in the act of sighing, head back, mouth open slightly, and a demure hand pressed to her cheek. Her face was partially hidden by a large pair of protruding goggles, rather like Sam's goggles from Hoban, only these were much larger and more protruding. This statue. He stopped dead in his tracks. He had seen it before in God's Temple and in the Mystery Library where she had carried the large book. Now here she was right in front of him. This time, she carried no book in her slender arms. He reached the counter. Nobody was present. There was a stack of business cards and a clamshell that caught Kay's attention. The cards read, 1000 Kara Hill Park Gift Shop. Xandar, where fun and mystery are where you find them. He held the card and took heart. He had heard that Carahill maintained a wondrous shop of sorts, where he allowed those who pleased him to roam about and have whatever they wanted. The store was full of Carahill's charm and light. Oh, to be a child here. If any could save Leica, it was Carahill. Carahill! He called out. It is I, Kay! Carahill, I have urgent need of you. His voice echoed in the giant space. Kay stood there, holding the card. Kara Hill! An alluring voice from behind him spoke. He felt breath on his ear. Something you like? Kay whirled around. Standing there was a thin female on the tallish side, wearing a fine teal gown of extraordinary quality. She reminded Kay of his aunt, Lady Poe. Her figure and turn of the cheek were similar, along with her complexion, her lean, upright body, and her head of boy-short platinum blonde hair. Her shoulders and line of the neck were the same, only she was more cut, more provocative than Lady Poem. She wore an elaborate pair of telescoping silver goggles that obscured her eyes and much of her face above her nose. The lenses glowed with ethereal purple light. Here stood the statue given life at last. She leaned in and encroached on his personal space, giving him no room. Kay tried to gauge her age, but it was impossible. Sometimes she seemed like a little girl, fresh with life. Other times she gave the impression of great age and wisdom. She carried with her a fierce presence, an invasive, aggressive sort of quality that Kay found off-putting, though she looked rather like Lady Poe. She acted nothing like her. Who are you? Please? He asked. She adjusted her goggles and spoke carefully, articulating her words. My name is Aetha. Kay searched his memory for the name, certain it had great significance, but couldn't recall it. I'm sorry, I don't know the name. We saw you in God's temple, did we not? And again in the library. Aetha laughed. Of course you did. She came in close and lifted her arms, as if she wished to embrace and possibly kiss him. Kay sidestepped to his right and created some space. Are you the proprietor of this store, Lady Aetha? My father is she replied. And who is that? She laughed. Why, Carahill, silly. Kay was thunderstruck. Carahill is your father? Yes, of course. 
Kay looked her over. Carahill was a newly minted god, therefore his children would also be gods and goddesses. Aetha had a vast presence about her. She could possibly be a goddess, but he assumed Carahill's daughter, if ever he had one, would be different somehow. More like Carahill himself, perhaps. Tattooed at the end of her left collarbone was the tiny glittering image of a resplendent seal, Carahill himself. As if reading his thoughts, she answered, Were you expecting a daughter of Carahill to be a little animal of some sort? We can be whatever we want. I could be an animal if I wanted. Then why aren't you? Because I like being a human. So few expectations come with this form. Come, I'll prove it to you. She held out her hand. My friend is dying. If you are Kara Hill's daughter, can you help her? Aetha smiled and adjusted her goggles again. The Hightath, you mean? I find it odd that a Vith should care so much for his ancient enemy. Leica is not my enemy. That remains to be seen. Come, I have things to show you. I promise she'll not die for the time being. She held out her hand, impatient for Kay to take it. He glanced at the island and Leica's still form at the top, along with the audience of seals gazing up at her from below. King's shiny bird eyes blinked back at him from the rail. Tentatively, he took Aetha's hand and she led him away through the rows. The selection of odd, neatly shelved items was bewildering. Where is Carahill? Kay asked. Aetha led him to an aisle lined with toys and colorful boxes. Her grift was soft but strong at the same time. Oh, he's far away. In God's temple, you asked for help and I heard you. Here I am. I stayed near just for you. Philip and Sarah asked for Carahill. Sorry, you got me instead. And you are Carahill's daughter, Kay asked again. Aetha ignored his question. She released Kay's hand and browsed a vast collection of items on the shelves. She leaned down and pointed out a box. Ah, here, come see. She pointed at a child's doll in a Duraplaz box. It was a foot-high effigy of Aetha as a young girl, wearing a complicated gown and crooked little smile. The doll's platinum blonde hairstyle was the same. The eye-obscuring goggles were there as well. Bold labeling on the box read, The Children of Carahill Series. Aetha of the Quest. Youngest daughter of Carahill and Mab Sornath. Goddess of occasional chaos. Kay stood there looking at the labeling and was somewhat stunned. Aetha laughed and covered the last line with her hand. Don't worry about that last part, she said. I'm harmless. Kay looked over the myriad of other boxes on the shelf and was amazed by what he saw. There was a doll of his mother, Countess Sigillus, complete with gown, red hair, and shadow mark, and also one of his father, Captain Davidge, in his fleet uniform. There was Sarah and Philip, Thomasina in her green and brown armor, Magistrate Kylos in her black suit, and he pulled a box off the shelf. There was a doll of himself, purple-haired and green-eyed, and another box. This time was Sam, bone white and jet black, holding her orange and Nuian jar. And another with Leica, uninjured, standing tall, wearing a miniature belt dangling with Duraplaz weapons. Leica nearby, dying. Aetha once again read his thoughts. The wonders available here are not to be taken lightly. Nothing is beyond reach or out of the question here. If there's any place your Hightath friend can be saved, you've found it. Aetha took his hand and pulled him down the aisle. They reached an area profuse with toy dollhouses of various sizes, some quite large and complex. Situated amid the dollhouses was a large and rather complicated doll in a clear Duraplaz package. It read in splashy lettering, Queen Gom, Woman of a Thousand Faces. Deluxe set. Kay picked it up. It was big, nearly covering his full arm length. In the center of the package was a doll in a roughly female proportion. The doll had no face, just a smooth blank spot where a face should be. Had no hands, feet, hair, or breasts. Surrounding the doll were dozens and dozens of mask-like faces with different colors and styles of hair. There were also hands in various alien configurations. Feet, scaly wings, tails, and other odd accessories. This is the enemy, the one who has stolen my knee countess's face. 
The process she uses to achieve this is not understood, Kay said. It's understood by me. It's all there on the package if you look carefully, Aetha answered. Kay tore the packaging open and pulled the faceless doll out. He took one of the faces included in the package and tried to put it on the doll's blank face, but it would not stay. Aetha barged in. You're not doing it right. You'll never get anywhere that way. Let me show you. At the bottom of the package was a small tube. Aetha took the tube and removed the cap. She squeezed it and a puff of golden glitter came out, coating the doll's blank face. She then took the face Kay was holding and attached it. It held fast and wouldn't come off. The previously faceless doll now had a perfect, seamless face like it had always been there. He noted a splash on the package's surface. Included Ethelberry, comma, no berry, Queen Gomes, magic dust. Ethelberry? he asked. Aetha smiled. Ah, yes indeed. Well, a, a facsimile. Let me show you the real thing. Come. Aetha led him away to a distant part of the store, so distant that he could no longer see Leica on top of the island without sighting. They arrived at another slightly smaller rotunda, flush with purplish daylight. Basking under the rotunda was a lacy iron fountain, gurgling with clean, fresh-smelling water. Surrounding the fountain was a bed of apparently hard-packed, ill-kept earth, covered with a dull patch of thorny weeds. The weeds were a dirty olive color, hiding an occasional speckling of drab yellow flowers. The weed bed seemed most out of place surrounded by the clean aisles and sweet-smelling environs of the store. It looked like something that would be growing wild in the cracks of an alley. Here we are, Aetha chirped. This is a wonder seldom seen. Kay looked around, not certain what he should be seeing. I'm sorry, I... The water smelled clean and inviting. Aetha seated herself on the bench near the fountain. Would you mind loosening my gown? She showed him her back. It was slim and curvy, her spine well-defined. Kay undid the laces and Aetha sat with her bare back to the stone bench. So, you want to save your wife and assist your Hightath lover, is that correct? Leika is not my lover. Really, Kay? There is no need to lie to me. I won't tell. So, do you want Gome's secret, yes or no? Kay noted a definite change in Aetha's bearing. From the tone of her voice and her deliberately aloof demeanor, he knew she wanted something and was attempting to prep him for some sort of pending shock. Yes, I want it, he replied. And what would you do to secure this help, Kay? Pardon? It's a simple question. I'm not my father. I don't do things for free. I can help you. The question is, what are you willing to pay for my help? What are your wife and your Hightath lover worth to you? Their worth is invaluable. I would pay anything. Aetha smiled. How nice. She produced two unglazed clay flower pots and a silver flask. Here, Kay. Fill the flask with water and put one plant in each of these pots. She handed them to Kay. I've no time for gardening, he said. Of course you do. If you want to save your wife and your lover, go on. Kay unstoppered the flask and filled it to the brim with clear water. Aether removed one of her shoes and dipped her foot in the water. She sighed with pleasure. This water comes from the spring of Salon May. This water is the beginning of dreams and is served at the table of the gods, cold and clear. Now, fill those pots. Mind the thorns. They're rather sharp. Kay knelt down and began the process of filling the pots. The going was rough. The ground around the fountain was hard and unyielding. May I have some tools? He asked. No, sorry. Cultivating these plants by hand is a tradition. Please proceed. Kay dug his hands in. The weedy plants were studded with savage thorns that quickly shredded his fingers. They caught on his clothes and tore his sleeves like tissue. As Aetha watched, he continued on, though his hands were soon bleeding. He wrenched two plants from the hard earth, placing them in the pots. Those thorny little weeds you're struggling with are 
Ethelberry K, the mythical dust of the gods. Don't look like much, do they? Ethelberry is, sometimes, the very first plant to grow on a new world. It's prickly and ugly, but its dust seethes with life and possibilities. The old goddess Anabrax often planted it on new worlds, and once life took hold, she would harvest them and move on. Now that Anabrax, thanks to the horn god you know so well, is gone, Ethelberry's pretty hard to find these days. Fortunately, she taught me how to plant and tend to it. I am the only one who ever listened to her. Good thing you got me at God's Temple, K. Otherwise, your little wife might be standing the rest of her life in that capsule back on Hoban. In the corridor, you were carrying a large book. That's why I went to the mystery library to fetch it. What was in the book? Aetha blushed and swished her foot through the water. Oh, nothing. It's just a prop to entice you to come to me. Work! Didn't it? Looks like you're done with the pots. Please give them to me. Kay presented her with the pots containing their unassuming cargo. His blood coated the pots. She took Kay by the hands. Oh, just look at you. I know your hands are hurting and Ethelberry thorns are covered in poison. I'd say you only have a short time to live. Kay looked at his bloody hands. His blood was bubbling, turning a putrid shade of brown. He felt the poison in the first stages of killing him. Gods, he stammered. Aetha put the pots down. Come here, Kay. She took a decanter and drew some water from the fountain. Hold out your hands she said kindly, and washed his torn flesh with the water. As she worked, Kay fell into a prismatic dream full of flowers and scents. Images flashed into his head as Aetha tended to his hands. The modest cabin on the gold coast of Hoban, asleep but moving, nude, many arms around him, a giant body all over him, moving together, grunting in ecstasy, making love to Leica, fast asleep somebody else inside him. He awoke with a start. Aetha was still cleansing his hands. She laughed. The dreams this water inspires. Oh, and you needn't worry about the poison. The water has nixed it. Just one of the many things this water can do. Wasn't gonna let you die, silly. I wonder what my father would have said about that. Now, for a sight rarely seen. She put her decanter down and carefully plucked a single flower from one of the pots Kay had filled. She tapped the flower and a cloud of vivid golden dust drifted out, colding his hands. The feel of it settling against his skin was indescribable. That dust is Ethelberry, pure and rare. The power of life, the unbounded energy, the healing itch. Do you feel it? The dust of the gods comes from a lowly weed, Kay asked, only half conscious. Tisk tisk. Great things often have meager trappings. Watch what it can do. See what can be done. She worked Kay's hands like a sculptor, molding his flesh like wet clay, and his wounds closed. With her thumb and forefinger, she plucked one of his fingers clean off. No blood, no hole, just a clean, rounded stump as if his finger had never been attacked attached to his hand in the first place. Just as quickly, she popped the finger back on. And this is the process Queen Gome is using? He asked, his excitement growing. He was discovering something monumental. It is. Kay marveled at his flawlessly repaired hands. Queen Gome's secret was now revealed and proved under the bright lights and serene music of Kara Hill's store. Possibilities flashed through his head. With this, I can save Leica. And Sam. Aetha held out the pot. If you like, here, take it. Go save your Hytath lover. I know you're dying to. I'll be here when you're done. Aetha leaned back, watching him, her eyes hidden under her goggles. Kay took the pot and the silver flask and went back across the store to the top of the shale island with its chorus of unhappy seals. Leica had crawled a few feet from where she had been, leaving a trail of blood. She lay on her hands and knees, trying to raise one of her swords. She was weeping. Oh, gone, she gasped. Not comfortable. Cannot, cannot continue. Kill, kill, wake up. She moaned in agony, no longer able to hide the fact. Kay came to her side. Lake, I have something that will help you, I promise. 
Have courage for a bit longer. No leave. No leave, she pleaded. I'm not going anywhere, Leika, I promise. He turned her over. Now just lay flat. She painfully stretched out on the shale and Kay surveyed her ruined body. The most obvious wound was an open rocket blast that had burrowed into her chest cavity and rented her ribs, exposing her innards. King, get up here, he demanded. King fluttered to the top of the island. What have you there? King asked. A remarkable substance and the key to the mystery regarding Queen Gome. What is it? Ethelberry. King ruffled his feathers. Ethelberry is the stuff of children's stories. Nevertheless, and you are going to assist Leica with it? I am. Leica painfully breathed in and out. Kay had reviewed in his mind how Aetha had used the water and the Ethelberry. He had to be careful. He could not afford to waste any of it. King, I need some clean, damp cloths, please. King flew down the island, past the barking seals, and turned into one of the aisles. A moment later, he returned with a pair of colorful towels grasped in his silver feet. The towels were thick and soft, like something one might take to the beach. He hovered a moment and let them soak in the water at the base of the island as a disgruntled chorus of seals noisily watched. Then he flew up. King took one of the towels and cleaned the wound as best he could. I hope this doesn't hurt too much, Leica, he said. I wish I had something to deaden the pain. She moved a little in response. First, the water. He opened the flask and allowed a few drops to moisten the interior of the gaping wound. Now the dust. Setting the flask aside, he selected a flower from the thorny mass inside the pot. He tapped out a few grains from the flower, hoping to conserve as much as he could, and carefully dabbed the ragged wound. He could see the fine, glittery dust coating the interior. A little seemed to go a long way. Now what? He had partially expected the wound to spring to life and seal itself up, but it didn't do anything. Should we be seeing something? King asked as he watched. Kay racked his brains. He recalled Aetha treating his hands, how she had laid her hands on his and worked his fingers like wet clay. It was worth a try. He reached in and touched the jagged remains of Leica's ribs. To his amazement, the ribs became pliable under his fingers. They flexed and molded. It was like smoothing out the wrinkles of his bed sheets. It was hard going. He added more water and it became much easier. With gentle, fluid movements, Leica's ribs were made whole again under his touch. Soon the interior began to dry and he applied more water from the flask. Soon he had the wound cleaned out and rebuilt. He draped in layers of muscle and fat, dabbed her skin into place, and sealed the wound shut, clean as could be, like it had never been there. Leica, does that hurt? He asked as he moved on to another wound. She spoke in delirium. Leica, very fond of of Jarakon, she rasped. Two of her hands came up and touched him as he worked. With growing excitement and skill, Kay moved on. He was out of water and gave King directions to refill the flask. King fluttered off and quickly returned. Kay attended to the grotesque wound on her face, splashing water, dabbing and smoothing her gums and teeth back into service and closing the large hole in her cheek. She had a chunk taken out of her tongue as well, which he also fixed. Completely repaired, her face showed no sign it had been wounded at all. She looked like Leica again. He spent hours repairing her. King fetched a large bucket and made numerous trips to the fountain as Kay went through bucketful after bucketful, anointing Leica, healing her. Eventually, he removed over 70 tremble bullets from her body and over 20 pounds of metal and composite fragments from the man-to-man -man rocket hits mostly in her back, where she had tried to protect him. He found he could sight the bullets, plunge his fingers into her flesh, and pull the bullet out, leaving no hole. He repaired 15 lacerations, 2 feet of destroyed small bowel, 3 mangled breasts, a shattered spinal disc, a broken thigh bone, and a lacerated stomach. Her calves, ankles, and feet, as far as he could tell, were mercifully undamaged. Soon, Leica was no longer writhing in pain. He took her down off the island to 
a nearby bench where she could sit up as he worked. King, will you please try to find something for Leica to wear? Her armor needs to be clean first. King sped off. Kay wasn't certain what sort of clothing King might find for her to wear, but anything was better than that destroyed, gore-soaked breastplate. Charlcon has healing hands, she said with wonder. It's not the man, it's the stuff. This dust is amazing. We'll have you and everybody else put back together in no time. This is a moment to celebrate, for we have the knowledge at last. If only Rawl and his buddies knew how easy this is. He continued working. He had gotten used to looking square at her bare, six-breasted chest. It wasn't a big deal anymore. Leica belongs to Jarlkhan, she announced. What? No, no. Leica belongs to Jarlkhan, she shouted. He moved on from her torso and legs to her arms. Aside from being a bit grabby with her many arms, Leica was a good patient, eyes closed, enjoying the healing attention. Hungry. Leica hungry, she said. We'll see what we can find once I get you squared away. Her arms were a mess. The third arm on her left side was mostly severed. A generous splash of water and several dabs of ethelberry and he had it back on. Muscles repaired, bones mended, tendons reattached, skins stretched and smoothed over. He also repaired over 20 broken or in some cases mangled or missing fingers. He even found a few patches of diseased flesh, not a result of the battle, merely something she had been living with. Leica was not elder, and she suffered maladies of the flesh that elders did not. He smoothed the disease away as well, leaving pristine skin. Soon, he could find nothing more to fix. All the Tremblay bullets that showed up in his sight as glittering stars were gone, piled up in a bucket. All the lacerations repaired. All the holes plugged. Leica, how do you feel? She checked herself over and gave Kay a grand, crushing, bare-chested embrace, lifting him into the air, spinning him around. She laughed strong and clear, bursting with energy. She threw him down into the water near the island, scattering the seals, flopping on top of him, wanting to wrestle. They rolled around in the water and laughed. After they roughed house a bit, King returned. He had brought a garment of light white cloth folded into a square. Kay took the garment and unfurled it, certain it'd be much too small for her. To his surprise, the garment was huge and billowy, stamped with Kara Hill's smiling face. What's more, it had three armholes on each side. It was almost as if the garment had been custom made for Leica. Where did you find this? On a display of shelving units not far from here. There were a number to choose from in various gaudy shapes and paintings. I naturally chose a conservative color. Kay checked the tag. It read GX3. He was perplexed. GX3? What's that? The G must be for giant and the X3 for three sets of armholes, he mused. King appeared neither amused nor impressed. Leica took it and pulled it on. It fit perfectly, though he thought she looked a bit odd wearing it. Very comfortable, Leica like, she said happily. They moved out onto the aisles, looking for food. Kay could smell the pastel aromas of sweet confections floating about. There was an abundance of candy here in the store. Carahill was a big fan of sweets. He hoped they might find something more substantial to help Leica regain her strength. Leica quickly found a terraced dining area lined with inviting shelves and display cases full of a treasure trove of candy, chocolates, frosted cakes, ice creams, and gorgeous pastels, hard candies in bags, spun sugar, taffy, and other treats. Before he could stop her, Leica was pulling bags of candy Candy off the shelves six at a time. Hey, I just got done fixing your teeth and now you're gonna mess them up again with candy? Leica brought an impressive armload of bag candy and tore into it, popping in loaded handfuls. Good, she announced. Such confections are not furnishing your system with useful calories, King said, fluttering near her head. She swished him away. Away, bird! Leica not care. Kay watched all of this and was elated. They had stumbled into Carahill's wondrous store and happened upon the key to saving Leica. Sam and the rest. The secret the Hospitowers had long sought to recover was in his grasp 
and had proven effective in saving Leica from certain death. As Leica and King bickered over sweets, King went to find the fountain and gather more Ethelberry. He would need gloves as he didn't want to tear his hands up again and a larger vessel for the water as he found a lot of water from the pool made the procedure easier. When he arrived at the fountain, a metal cage of lacy black iron like a bird cage had been dropped down over it. A sign reading, Display Closed, hung over the locked gate. He tried it and couldn't get it open. He tried wafting through and it resisted. He stood in frustration. Atha! he called out. Yes, Kay? came a voice from behind him. There was Atha, sitting comfortably on the stone bench. Is your friend all better, I see? Up and around, hoarding candy, is she? I'll be certain my father sends you a bill for all of that, by the by. Why is this fountain locked? he asked. Why? Because Ethelberry is precious, that's why. And it's not exactly plentiful anymore, is it? When Anabrax died, chained to the Horn Grod stone, most Ethelberry lore died with her, except that which she taught me. You'll find it nowhere in the wild, except for right here, around this fountain. I need it. Sorry. Aetha produced a second pot that Kay had picked. The weedy leaves and thorns glistened with his blood. You picked this one. You bled for it. So you can have it. It's enough to correct one person and one person only. The water is fairly common. You're resourceful. You shouldn't have any trouble acquiring more. There are many to save, Kay pleaded. I'm sorry, she said. This is all the Ethelberry I can spare. I have to tend to an entire universe after all. Kay wasn't going to give up. I'll pay for it. Pardon? I'll pay whatever you want. Name your price. Aetha smiled and adjusted her goggles. My price? Goodness. What would a goddess need or want? Hmm. Aetha stood and walked around him in a playful manner, nudging his back and arms with a momentary wisps of goddess touch. Would you sing to me? Would you pledge me your card? Would you quest on my whim? Her voice took on a dark note. Would you offer me your flesh? Would you engage in perversions and travesties? Would you slit a thousand throats? Would you lie in my bed, your arms around me? Though Kay couldn't see her eyes behind her goggles, he felt them burning. Would Kara Hill's daughter ask such a thing, he asked. She didn't answer. Kay lost patience. I have no time to waste. I shall consult with Kara Hill in person, inform him that his daughter might require additional training in the art of civility, and not be satisfied till he has given proper ear to my plight. Gonna tell on me? Good luck with that, Aetha said. Kay took the pot and walked away. He had taken several steps when Aetha called out to him. You shouldn't give up so easily. Kay stopped. Aetha held out her arms. I thought you'd put up a bigger fuss before promising to run off and tell my father how bad I am. You need to learn to be a better negotiator, like your father. Come here, Kay. I don't have time for continued games. Come and sit. Please. Kay returned to the bench near the fountain and seated himself. Aetha stood over him. There is something I want, Kay. Everybody wants something, even the gods. What do you want? Come on, Kay, think about it. But what would a goddess want? And why would she need to come to you for it? I have something you want, Ethelberry. And you have something I want. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this discussion, would we? I will offer you my help if you promise to help me in turn. I'll ask again, what do you want? Aether refused to be pinned down to specifics. Do we have a deal? Yes or no? Whatever it is that I want certainly doesn't compare to your current needs. Your knee countess needs, does it? Tell me truthfully and I will help you. King answered without thinking. Fine then. Help me now, and we'll sort out the ramifications of this later with your father. Do we have a deal? Yes or no? Yes, we have a deal. When may I collect my payment? Kay thought about it. When my Countess Jar is completed. Aetha laughed. Done! 
Wonderful. I'm certain my father will give me a nice earful over this another time. She produced a large vessel full of water. Here's some water, more than you'll need to tend to one person unless you waste it. Kay took it. Now, as I said before, I can't let you have any more dust from here, but I'll tell you where more can be found, more than enough to tend to your people. Anabrax once had a wondrous urn full of seemingly magical golden dust that she used to experiment with various flora and fauna and to grant favors when she was so inclined. I know what you're thinking, but the urn did not, and I repeat, did not contain Ethelberry. Instead, it overflowed with a sort of lesser Ethelberry. No berry, I call it. It can't do many of the things the real stuff can, and it cannot breathe life into the dead. But for simple temporary parlor tricks, for extracting sickness and for altering the flesh, it works just fine. None of the things accomplished with no berry lasts forever. Maybe only for a couple hundred years. Your immortal Queen Gome learned of this urn full of no berry long ago. She knew of rumors and children's stories that caught her attention. She had much time to contemplate being blind, deaf, and mute, wearing rotten, stitched on parts that only works so well. She pursued the legend into Zaffin space, taking a lifetime or two, spending several fortunes and stepping over the corpses of her various lovers until finally discovering the secret. Gom discovered the location of Anabrax's temple, raised an army, and captured the urn centuries ago, using the dust and the water to give herself new, fresh parts whenever she wishes or whenever the effects of the Noberry dust wore out. Imagine to be freed at last from the tomb of her immortal body. She became drunk with the possibilities. She learned her art well and changed her appearance often. Sometimes she would even become a man or an exotic beast. She does have an amazing imagination. She had a great wailing room on Trimble where she kept the victims of her caprices alive, for if they died, the Noberry could not sustain the stolen parts. Yet another of its limitations. And where is this fabled urn? Kay asked. He felt he already knew the answer. It's one of her most cherished possessions. She keeps it most often in her bower chest behind lock and key. You didn't need me to tell you that, did you? Bower chests, per antiquity, are said to be invincible. Aetha shrugged her shoulders. That is true. Look for a way to deactivate it. That's up to you to discover. You're a capable fellow. I'm certain you'll be successful. Where is it? Where is Queen Gome's bower chest? Kay asked. Ask your magistrate. What? Oh, so many questions, Kay. I've already given you invaluable information, so use it and save your knee countess. I repeat, if you have questions, ask your magistrate. And remember, when your knee countess jar is complete, I shall be calling on you for my payment. And don't try to trick me, Kay. Your jar will be completed. I require more beyond mere hints and promises of toil to come, he said. Aetha shrugged. What more do you want? Kay held out the pot. I want you to deliver this pot and the water to the Hospitowers on the Gold Coast of Hoban at once. I'm not a delivery service, Kay. And I am not in the habit of giving out favors. I care not who your father is. Our jar will be finished when I desire it to be finished. Either deliver these goods to the Hospitowers on Hoban, or our deal is off. Sam will never work on her jar again. I shall make certain of it. We shall remain childless if need be. Aetha thought a moment and then laughed. You're a bit more devious than I thought. Very well. I shall deliver these goods as asked, but expect no more of me. The pot with the ethelberry and the tankard of proper water. Yes, of course. And you will take them in working order to the Hospitowers precisely as, Yes, yes, Kay, I know where to take them. And never fear, I'm not out to trick you or twist your words or get out of a promise. When I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Your instructions are vaguely worded and leave much to chance, but my father's teachings were not lost on me. You know, I know what you want and where you want them to go. I will deliver them as is, and they shall work flawlessly, but do not ask one iota more. This is all I can give you. Remember, what would my father say? Oh yeah, balance. I can't upset balance. Very dangerous. 
Now I must leave. She walked away and spoke over her shoulder. Farewell, Lord Blanchford, but not goodbye. She faded and was gone, leaving the fountain and its weedy treasure secure behind their iron cage. Alone, Kay tried the cage one more time. Locked. Not budging. Before Kay's eyes, the fountain, the weeds, and the cage itself vanished, leaving only a sign on an iron stand. Ethelberry display temporarily removed for maintenance. Somewhat dejected, Kay returned to Leica and King. Leica was grabbing everything she could find. She had collected a massive assortment of bag candy, a pile of colorful shirts like the one she was wearing, and numerous toys. Even with six arms, she was having trouble carrying it all. Jarocon! she cried, holding aloft a bag of candy. For celebration! She said, tearing it open. She popped in a handful of jawbreakers and merrily crunched on them. She had a giant cloth bag, which she stuffed everything into. In went the candy. Half a dozen shirts, Kara Hill mementos that caught her eyes, and a number of posable dolls in boxes. Kay stopped and had a look at one. The dolls were the likenesses of his parents, Captain Davidge and Countess Sigillis, dressed in miniature clothing packaged with accessories, cargs, pre-shaped shadow techs, the works. There were also dolls of Sarah and Philip with sap accessories, and one of Thomasina in her green and brown armor, complete with a Mount Calm club, and several of himself wearing different outfits. Conspicuously missing from the lot was a doll of Sam, and Kay found himself wanting one. He returned to the aisle Aetha had shown him and had a look. Leica had rifled through the boxes, making a grand mess in the process. In sorting through some of the boxes, Kay found a doll of King, a sinister one of Tal Daroga with balled up fists, and a number of Sam, none of which Leica had chosen to take with her. In some, Sam was wearing her old black monoma gown. In others, she was wearing colorful vith clothing, a bathing suit, even a nightgown. He found one of her holding her earthen jar, seeing her beautiful pale face so full of love resting on a nest of black hair, nearly brought tears to his eyes. He stared at her for many minutes. Lord Blanchford, King called, ending his musing. He took several Sam dolls with him and headed back. Come, it's time to return to the castle. First things first, we strike at the Jones. Our objective is the recovery of the damn cryo chest. And this time, it shall be we dictating terms of battle, not Tal Daroga. Castle Blanchford is ours, and its secrets are our own. King blinked in agreement. Though he said nothing, he was clearly eager to have at the Jones. Laker? it's time to move out. You need to suit up. Leica frowned. She seemed quite happy roaming the store bootless in her giant cotton shirt. Kay went to the island and with difficulty dragged her mangled breastplate down to the water and cleaned it off as best he could. The armor was destroyed by the Jones man-to-man rockets and seemed unwearable. Leica saw the damage. Leica just wear a shirt, she announced. And no boots. You'll need protection and you need your boots. Jarkon here you'll Leica again. He brought her down her boots and reluctantly she pulled them on and laced them up. King returned carrying a large black garment. I located something she can wear in place of the armor. It was a corset-like composite garment, giant size and sporting multiple armholes with small round discs of metal sewn into the material. Leica took it from King and eyed it skeptically. Seems to be a lightweight composite material. Seems very durable, King said. She pulled off her cotton shirt and wiggled into the composite. Oddly, it seemed to fit quite well on her alien high-tath form and had numerous pockets. Kay pulled the straps tight for her. You good? Kay asked. She nodded and strapped on her weapons belt, her swords freshly cleaned in the cool shale island water. They headed out of Kara Hill's wondrous store and out into the node between places. And with that, we conclude part two, chapter nine, 1000 Kara Hill Park. And in this chapter we meet Aetha and Aetha claims and apparently proved her claim that she is the daughter of Carahill. She's the youngest daughter of Carahill and if you're familiar with my children's books and you really ought to be she's basically the main character even though it's 
they're entitled Kara Hill's Busy Morning. It's mostly Kara Hill and her, and she's usually the catalyst. She's um, the youngest of his daughter, and like she does in this chapter, she appears in, in human form. Although as a little girl, in the in the book, she's a fully grown adult with um kind of a dark streak to her. You never quite know what her motives are, what she actually wants. And as it said on the box of her doll, it said. Aetha of the Quest and if you knew what the Quest actually stood for you'd find it's not quite PG rated it's more R possibly X rated I mean my old publisher went round and round on that he hated that I'm like that's just how she is she's not a carbon copy of Carahel and obviously given her dialogue with Kay she wants something that Kay can provide to her and it should be passing your mind like what is all this about what is it really about obviously from the first book it's not a Perlamum tournament and that's nothing really to do with all these doings all these shenanigans what is actually at stake what does Kay not putting together in his head we'll find that out in a few chapters but so that is Leica and you know she has she's the seventh child of Kara Hill and Mab Sornath, who is the cat goddess of destruction, at least on Xandar. She's actually the goddess of knowledge, but on Xandar, she's considered the goddess of destruction. And God's temple on Xandar was actually an old temple dedicated to Mab Sornath. And he, she is Kara Hill's wife. And they had seven children. And kind of like Lady and the Tramp, if they have girls or cats, and they had boys, they're like seals, mostly. They can be whatever they want, but the gods kind of follow the old rules, and mostly they appear in animal form. Aetha also can appear in animal form. When she does, she appears as a, a harsh sprung, which is like a mythical, mischievous creature. It kind of fits in with her with her with her nature a little bit so using the ethelberry that Aetha introduced Kay to and water of the island of Salonme which is located on the planet Tremble on the upside down island that floats over the surface Kay was able to repair Leica and discovered Queen Gome's secret where Queen Gome had heard about this mystical urn that could allow you to basically swap parts seamlessly and she quested for it and raised an army and captured it and it's full of of not Ethelberry, but a, a lesser dust, Noberry, that can't do all the various things that Ethelberry can, but it can do, still do quite a bit. And swapping parts is one of the things it can do. The part, the, the bond isn't permanent, like Aetha said, it only lasts for a couple hundred years, but that'll actually do them just fine, or they can always refresh it later on. So, Queen Gome's secret is unearthed we know now how she does it now we just have to get to her and get to this urn that whole ordeal still lies before us next week we continue we're getting close to the end of the second part of this book part two chapter 10 hyper staff as Kay, Leica, and king return to castle blanchford and spoiled at have round two with the jones and as Kay said this time they're gonna dictate the terms of battle so we'll see what happens next week as we get to part two, chapter 10, The Hyper Staff. And until then, this is Ren Presents. I am your host, Ren. Peace out.